Hello and welcome to episode number 117 of the Savvy Social Podcast. This is a show dedicated to helping passion-led entrepreneurs and business owners just like you learn how to use social media as a tool to grow your business. I'm your host, Andrea Jones, and I'm fiercely committed to helping you understand both the how and the why of social media marketing so that you can create connection, build community, and make your difference in the world. Now, this show is brought to you by Fan Booster by Traject, which is the world's most complete social media management tool, and it's my tool of choice when it comes to things like scheduling, managing, and especially reporting on social media. Try them out for yourself. I'll put the link in my show notes. Today's guest is Joe Sanek. Joe and I met at PodFest, which feels like 10,000 years ago, Uh, but PodFest is a podcasting event that happens in Orlando, Florida, and uh, Joe and I met at that event this March, so March 2020, literally right before the pandemic hit, and it was just one of those happenstance meetings, and this is what I love about in-person conferences, which I'm so excited to get back to maybe one day, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of the Zoom life. I don't know if you guys are like this, but I love in-person conferences and the difference between a Zoom conference or a virtual conference versus an in-person one is that there's no hallways to bump into people. You know what I mean? Like you show up for your session, sure, and you watch it or you present it, but there's no like in between. You're just kind of like working or hanging out or whatever the case may be. So in this particular instance, Joe and I, bumped in line at Starbucks at PodFest. (laughs) We were talking about, uh, I was vlogging the event. You can check out the vlog on my YouTube channel. It's called PodFest 2020. I vlogged my experience there, Um, but I was vlogging and I was using Pat Flynn's SwitchPod as a tripod for the event. And we got to talking about that. I asked what he did, he asked what I did, and he actually introduced me to someone else. We were all in line together. Um, Anyways, I don't know why I'm sharing that story, just the power of happenstance. And I try to recreate those experiences on social media. It's not quite the same, but you can do something similar with a voice message on Instagram or sending a DM or just asking for like a virtual coffee date with someone who may be a good fit for that for you. So in this episode, though, Joe and I sit down to talk about social media for practitioners. So a little bit about Joe. He is a keynote speaker, TEDx speaker, business consultant, and podcaster. Joe has the number one podcast for counselors. It's called The Practice of the Practice Podcast. Check out my episode. I'll put that link in the show notes as well. He has interviewed people like Pat Flynn and John Lee Dumas and Lewis Howes, and he's really a rising star in the speaking world. He's also a writer for Psych Central and has been featured on Huffington Post, Forbes, Good Magazine, Reader's Digest, Entrepreneur on Fire, and Yahoo News. He is the author of five books and has been named the Therapist Resource Top Podcast Consultant and Blogger. And on this show, we actually talk about his new book, uh, contracted by Harper Collins, called Thursday is the New Friday. Um, At the time that we recorded this, I know he was just in the process of kind of getting that together. So um, definitely check out his socials for updates there. But In this episode, we talk about social media from his perspective, what he's been doing and what he recommends for his clients. So things like LinkedIn groups or um, Facebook lives and how to repurpose that. He has a really great strategy for repurposing all of that. We talk about things like doodly videos and how to create dynamic content on social media. So definitely stay tuned. This episode kind of goes all over the place, but it's a very interesting conversation and I think you'll enjoy it. So here we go. This episode with Joe Sanek. Hey, Joe, welcome to the show. Oh, Andre, I'm so excited to be here. I am really excited to talk to you about all things social and what you're doing because I'm personally fascinated by it. Um, But for those of you who don't know Joe, I want you to give me a quick like 30 second rundown of um, like what you're all about and kind of your why for what you're doing. 
Ooh, I like starting with the why rather than just like what I'm doing. Uh, so I would say my why is to just live a life that has, you know, some influence on the world, some impact on the world, um, that I'm able to be an awesome father and have time for my kids. Um, but also to really disrupt kind of the way that people do things specifically in the coaching and counseling world. Uh, because a lot of folks just don't know how to sell themselves or to offer products or even understand their own value. And so when I can help uh, coaches and counselors and therapists to just see their value of how much they can give the world. Uh, it helps the world be a better place, but then also we can make you know substantial living off of it. Yes, I love that why. I think that is the impact that, that we all want to have with what we're doing is um, making a difference not only for ourselves and our families, but for the people who really rely on us for those kinds of things. Um, okay, so, but let's talk about your podcasting strategy and um, so how you started creating podcast episodes from LinkedIn groups, I, we have to hear about this story. Yeah, so um, this was in probably 2012 when I first launched my website, Practice of the Practice. Uh, it was aimed at that time just at kind of counselors, therapists, psychologists that had private practices. And so I was in a bunch of LinkedIn groups. I had been very resistant to LinkedIn. I always got those emails like, join LinkedIn, join LinkedIn, and it felt kind of like, I don't know, Yahoo News and you know AOL, like I don't really need to be a part of that. Uh, but then I finally jumped in, some friends of mine said, no, it's actually pretty active and a lot of great professionals there. And I joined a few different groups that was aimed at therapists and private practice. And all those groups uh, had rules around kind of self-promotion and you're not supposed to just put your blog posts out there. But a lot of them had a rule that, you know, if someone asks a question, do you know any resources about say blogging and SEO? Uh, you could then put a link in if that happened. And so rather than answer questions just in that thread within LinkedIn, what I would frequently do was if someone said, hey, do you have any resources on blogging and SEO? I would go and record a podcast episode about SEO and blogging, or I'd write a blog post about it. And then 10 minutes later, 20 minutes later, after I quickly got that content up, I'd say, oh, magic day. Uh, I just happened to you know, release something today that is about that exact topic. And I probably did that 20 times and just got such a large audience in a short period of time um, by answering people's questions, but not doing it in a place that was just going to be hidden and, and disappear. But it also then allowed me within my podcast to be answering questions that people out in the world were already asking. Uh, like, how do you name a counseling private practice? Um, I never even thought of that as something that someone would Google or think through. But then I wrote an answer as so just a quick three-step thing on how do you name a counseling private practice? And within two months, it was ranking number one. And I didn't even realize that, that it wasn't even a strategy to try to rank number one for that. Um, and so it allowed me to really understand my audience without really having an audience at the time. That's so fascinating because it really goes against the grain of what some uh, other experts and gurus say out there, which is, you know, try to create this customer avatar and think about what they would say. And what you're doing is you're going straight to the potential client or customer, literally taking the questions that they're asking and creating content pieces as a solution to that. Um, I have a quick question about that. When you're kind of creating those processes, was it an answer to some Thing you already knew or did you have to like dig deep for those answers what what was that process like for you yeah, for most of them, there were things that I was already implementing. And so I already had a counseling private practice. It was a side gig compared to my full-time job. Um, but it, it was something that I just kind of thought through the answer. There were times that I had to learn a little bit more about SEO and be able to say some of the terms, like I didn't know what a meta description at the time was. And so just what are basic terms that I should know? And then to put it in my own words, to not just rip someone else's piece of content off, but to say, you know, meta descriptions, that little blue thing you see, and to make it personalized. Uh, and so there was a lot of my own learning that sped up as well, because if I know the top 20 questions that people are asking, those are going to repeat themselves over and over. And once I have that piece of content, now to even take it a step farther, anytime in the future someone asks that same question, which you know you see on social media over and over, or you get emails over and over of the same question, you can just point to that content and say, hey, I have a 10 minute podcast all about that. Uh, and then we actually packaged those MP3s together in Gumroad and sold them, even though they were free on the podcast, we packaged them as a startup package for like 50 bucks. And even though they were free, it made it easier for them because we had PDFs that went along with it as well. Whoa. Okay. So not only did you give so much value as a free resource, you packaged it together and sold it. That's 
brilliant when it comes to you know creating content that really you you cut down on the half like your your audience having to search and find it by putting it together yeah and i think that's the thing a lot of people miss is that you know yeah you may have 400 episodes um, but it's a difference between an information gap which there's plenty of information out there uh, versus an implementation gap. To implement, it's speed. It's not whether or not the info is out there. It's let's actually get some speed going here and tell you what to do. So to say, these are the five podcasts, if you want to rank higher in Google, that you have to listen to. And you may do that as a blog post, or you may do it as a paid thing that it includes the MP3s and then has a handbook that goes with it or has some you know kind of stock text that goes with it. To just say, how do I answer this question with content that maybe I've 50 to 70% created already. Mm, brilliant. I love it. I love it. So if a listener today was going to take this same strategy and use it in, you know, 2020 or going into 2021, um, what's something that you would suggest to them as a starting place for, for this? Is there like a hot spot you're seeing for finding questions like these? Yeah, I think, um, I now have shifted a little bit to say you should never be on a social media that you hate. Uh, And so if you don't like LinkedIn, even if it's the best opportunity and you hate being on it, that's going to probably come across. So there's plenty of social media out there that you're going to enjoy. So I would say first and foremost, start with social media you already enjoy uh, because that's going to come through. Um, Second, I would say then within that, look for people that are doing what you want to be doing. So these people had audiences of 10 or 20,000 people that were in private practice. There was no reason for me to start from scratch and to just start my own group. Why not be active in somebody else's group? So that could be a LinkedIn group. It could be a Facebook group. It could be commenting on other people's Instagram posts or doing a you know co-Instagram live with somebody else that's an influencer that you can add value to. And so I'd say figuring out where those people are that already have parts of the audience that you want to develop and then just really pay attention and give value to it uh, and make sure you follow the rules within those groups. Uh, I would say even directly reaching out to the owners of those groups and saying, you know, hey, I'm here. Here are some things that I can help you with. Let me know if you ever want to do a Facebook Live together for your audience. I would love to help. Uh, the more that they know who you are, if you do stumble, and you probably will, there may be some time that you post something and they say, hey, this isn't allowed. You don't want to be that jerk that just gets like kicked out of the group. You want to say, oh my gosh, I, I'm so sorry. I'll take it down. I didn't you know, see that as self-promotion, but now in re-looking at it, I see how you'd see it that way. My bad. They're going to have a lot more grace with you if they know who you are. Yes. I actually really like that strategy because I think some of us get afraid to put ourselves out there because we're afraid that we'll overstep. But uh, according to what you're saying, which is a great uh, kind of approach to it, is just approach it with a little bit of humbleness and still put yourself out there. And if you do overstep, you can still apologize for that genuinely um, if you didn't realize it. But you're still putting yourself out there. You're still answering those questions. You're still showing up and you're getting to know people and and becoming known. So it's a really great combination. And you are going to fail. I got kicked out of this 10,000 person group that I was really active in. And the lady was a super big jerk to me about it. And it was like, I wasn't being super self promoting uh, I had just followed the rules, but she saw it differently. And it's like, okay, I don't want to be in that group anyway, then, you know, if that's how she's going to react, glad you kicked me out because I don't want to be in that group. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I think that's interesting too, because I think we take it personally sometimes when that happens, but uh, I think that, you know, happens to everybody. (laughs) Well, yeah. And I think that, and that's a big difference, I think, in when I evaluate people that are successful versus not is they often have a kind of experimentation mindset versus a pass fail. And to, to really identify our egos and sense of self through our work can be a problem. You know, if that project fails and we've tied up our own ego into that, now we've failed as people and we feel bad about ourselves versus okay, that project didn't launch like I thought it would. They gave me some really good information about my audience. They're a bunch of cheapskates and I got to attract people that aren't cheapskates. Like, okay, so how do I now attract people that aren't just cheapskates? So, okay, great. I have that information and I'm not a lesser person because of it. It just didn't work. Yes, I love it. Taking that learning and learning from it. Uh, Okay, so let's shift gears a little bit because I want to now talk about Facebook Lives because I'm obsessed with your Facebook Live strategy, which we'll talk about the repurposing in a minute. Uh, But when you approach like going live on Facebook, is it similar to kind of like the podcasting blogging strategy you already laid out in this episode or does it look different? 
I'd say it looks different. So with the kind of Q and A style, you're directly saying, I see a need for this. I'm going to produce content and kind of ride that audience's coattails. Whereas with Facebook Live, you're kind of stepping into more of your own content. So a couple of things you want to do in preparation are think through what are those questions you are getting via email or on social media on, on a regular basis. And so start with those. What are your most popular blog posts? So for example, when I noticed that how to name a counseling private practice was ranking number one when people were searching that in Google, I want to make mini unicorns of that. So I randomly discovered that, and I stole that from someone. I don't remember who said that first, but I, I don't want to take credit because I didn't make that up. But they say when you find a unicorn, make mini unicorns. And so I did a bunch of Facebook lives about how to name a counseling private practice. I did a bunch of podcasts about how to name a counseling podcast or name a counseling private practice. I did a second blog post about it. And so you want to amplify what's already working rather than just starting from scratch each time. And, and so I would do a Facebook live about that specific topic. And then at that point, um, you know, you want to prepare, maybe have a little post-it note next to your camera on your um, computer. Uh, think through what you're going to say, what story kind of represents that would hook people in. Uh, oftentimes a good strategy is to start with, you know, the typical person will do this. So the typical online marketer will do these three things, but you're not the typical online marketer, are you? You want to stand out. And so people that stand out actually do these five things and they disregard those first three things. And so to just say, here's what the typical person does, but that's not you and me. That, that's not where we're headed. We aren't going to be typical. Uh, and so then walking through those and then usually having some sort of call to action. So that could just be, you know, comment below and then you're really active on that. It could be an email opt-in. It could be, you know, whatever you want that call to action to be. So after that, uh, what I do is for those that are the most popular Facebook lives or ones that are extremely relevant, I'll download those and upload it to my Dropbox that I share with my assistant, Sam. Uh, she then gets a notification at that point and everything else I'm about to explain, I don't do. <laughs> So Sam Imagine. then, she then takes that say five minute Facebook live. Uh, she makes some slides that go with it. She you know, adds little pretty graphics, makes it look more professional. She uploads that to YouTube. She then pulls the transcription from that, turns that into a blog post, embeds that YouTube video back into that blog post. She then finds other related videos on YouTube and goes and then comments on their videos. Great video. That's so awesome. Like this is so needed. So then that person will be like, who is this person? I've never seen them. And they might click back and see that video that was just posted at the top of the feed that's very closely related to theirs. Uh, then at that point, she'll turn it into a Pinterest graphic. And so those three to five points that I made, those become a Pinterest graphic uh, that, that then gets promoted through that. Uh, then we'll oftentimes add that to our email sequence. And so it'll be that transcription with the video in our email sequence. Uh, and then we may even then add it back into Facebook as its own standalone video. Whoa. Okay. So there's a lot of pieces there when, when you're talking about repurposing that Facebook live. And I want to kind of get a little bit more granular. Um, when you're setting this up with Sam, like when you first came up with this idea, um, how did you guys decide what should go where? Was it kind of like you broke it down or did it evolve over time? And the reason that I'm asking is we have quite a few listeners who do this for their clients. So I think when we're talking with our clients or when we're creating strategies like this, we're always curious about what should you purpose where. So I'm, I'm curious to get your guys' thought process on that. Yeah, I think when you're first starting out, I'm more interested in speed than accuracy. Uh, because I want to be able to see what takes off and what doesn't. I'm more interested in getting every Facebook Live up there as quick as possible than to have it be perfect. And so if you're working with a client to say, I want to do speed over accuracy, meaning you're setting yourself up for if you fail or miss the mark, you can go back to that anchor and say, remember at the beginning when we talked about we wanted to get these videos up quickly? I understand you don't like the music that I selected for video number four, but we're just looking for accuracy or speed over accuracy right now. And so, so first I would say you want to just get that basic, how is the video going to, because you have to download your video from Facebook Live to your own computer. Where's it going to go then? It could be Dropbox, could be Google Drive, like it doesn't matter. You just need to know where it's going. And that person needs to be able to get an automatic alert when a new file has gone in there. Because you don't want to have to always be texting or emailing and saying, hey, I just uploaded a video. Oh, I didn't see that. And then you, that's, you know, 20 seconds of your time, but that's 20 seconds of your energy that you could be spending on something else. 
So first, making sure that it goes to, say, Dropbox, and then they know what to do with it. So do you want just your name on it? Do you want a couple graphics? Do you want it to be sort of like a PowerPoint presentation with some nice looking slides? Um, what's the expectation of what they do with it? And then they need to have access to be able to upload that to your, your YouTube channel. Uh, so then they upload it. I'd say do a couple so that they're private so that the first few you can check to make sure they look good before they go public. And then how are you going to promote that video? So if you just get that down, you've taken your one five minute content. And now you have two pieces of content. Then I would add the next layer of getting it transcribed uh, and that either getting it transcribed or doing it through YouTube. You want someone that's going to read through it to make sure it sounds like a normal human and how a blog post should. So there's some extra time there. But if you're paying an assistant 15 bucks an hour, um, I mean, if you're a consultant that's even, you know, making 150 an hour, that 15 bucks an hour, you, that's 10 hours of time, you know, that you, you've just multiplied. So then at that point, that's when, you know, when you're doing that transcription, again, you want to check the first couple, um, but you really want your assistant, or if you're the one that's working for someone else, you want to be the one that makes the plan of how to implement it. Because the assistant or the person that's doing it is going to have the most buy-in if they create the plan rather than you just say, here's what I want you to do. You're going to do it this exact way. So I'll say, Sam, here's my big picture vision. I want to be able to do one piece of content and I want it to go to all these places what do you think we should do? And then she says, for me, it's going to be easiest if it goes to Dropbox and then I do this whole system. Great. Good job making a plan. I'm glad that works for you. And then I don't have to put my time into creating the plan of the actual logistical side of it. Yes. I, there's so many like golden nuggets in this episode, you guys. I hope whether you're watching or listening that you're taking notes because I think even, whether you have an assistant, whether you're doing this yourself, um, a lot of these strategies are really great for kind of uh, expanding those primary content pieces that you're creating. Basically taking your concepts, your ideas, your strategies and making sure that as many people see them as possible. And this kind of falls in line with um, some of the work that you do um, not only with, you know, helping these um, practitioners build their practices, but just like a larger idea of how you approach your life and your business. Um, and I know that you recently got a book contract and you're writing a book about this very concept. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I just landed a contract with HarperCollins, which is mind blowing. I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. These authors that I really respect are on there. Uh, and the idea is that the more that we set aggressive boundaries on our schedule, uh, the more we can get done. And so the working title is Thursday is the new Friday. Um, at some point, probably by the time this goes live, we'll have Thursday is the new Friday.com up. Um, but, but the idea is that um, by setting boundaries, you are aggressively making sure that you don't do everything. And so I work three days a week. I take Mondays and Fridays off. I check email for maybe 15 minutes on a Monday. Um, and I don't usually check any email on Friday unless my assistant texts me and says, emergency, like there's something that came through. Like they know that I take Fridays off. And so they only let me know if there's something really major that's come through. So by doing that, you know, in the past, if I had 50 tasks to do in a week, and in those three days, I could only do 20, the 20 most important tasks are going to rise to the surface. So if I get a letter in the mail from the IRS, that's going to go to the top of the list to read it and to make sure there's nothing that I owe or whatever. You know, if my accountant says, hey, something's off, like we need to talk, that's going to get to the top. If I have my top consulting clients that, you know, pay tens of thousands of dollars, if they text me and say, I need your help, like something happened, they're going to go to the top. So then the 20 most important things will be at the top of my list. And there will be then 30, or if there was 50 tasks in the week, there would be 30 tasks that go undone, um, which means I need to decide, am I going to outsource these to someone? And I'm, am I going to just ignore them? Uh, am I going to automate them in some way? Like, why am I not doing these tasks? And so it really helps you do what you do best and outsource the rest. Yes. Okay. I love the idea of outsourcing. And so I'm curious for um, things like managing your social media. You mentioned managing your inbox as well. Does your team help with that as well? Yeah. Yeah. So I have a director of details and she is, gets to be in my email. She has full access to my schedule. Um, there's even times where I'm like, can you move my haircut around back? You know, <laughs> like when I had haircuts before quarantine. Uh, so uh you know, she, she really kind of manages all those details. And so even if a friend texts me and says, hey, can I, um, 
like, can we hang out? Like, if I don't have time to do that, I'll just forward that onto her and say, hey, will you coordinate with this friend to figure out when they're going to do it? I try to not be that impersonal with friends, but you know, it's like, I want to move forward and not drop the ball on it. So then um, I have a team of three people in South Africa that uh, I've over the years developed. They actually all live in Cape Town and are friends with one another, which has been awesome because two of them live in the same building. Um, and if there's an issue, they can just be like, hey, let me run down to your computer and we can talk about this. That's and so, yeah, uh, we use things like Meet Edgar for a lot of our automation, but there's a lot of things that I still want the person to, to touch it, to oversee it, to look at it, especially when we're launching a product um, to make sure that those automations uh, are working like they're supposed to. So how do you feel about the personal touch when it comes to things like direct messages or comments on YouTube videos or social media posts? Um, I know some people are a little bit hesitant to outsource things like that. Um, how have you approached not being too impersonal or maybe not caring? I don't know. What's, what's your, yeah. yeah. Well, to me, like I have a family, I have a five-year-old and an eight-year-old. I have a wife, I have friends, I have weekends. And so I don't, want to spend more time than I think is beneficial on something. Um, and I don't want to be impersonal. So um, I probably wouldn't go through a bunch of YouTube channels to say, great video, I loved it, or this is what I liked about it. I just wouldn't do that. Whereas having an assistant do that with the practice of the practice account, it's like, you know, if McDonald's goes and, you know, says great video, and no one says, well, was that the CEO? Like, <laughs> you know, I can't believe that that was just one of their social media managers. And so if you do have your brand as the forefront, it's not just Joe Sanok, it's a whole brand and a whole team, then it's different than if, you know, if I was just a solopreneur and was pretending that I didn't have any assistance and then it was people responding as me, but nobody really knew that as a brand, that would feel a little icky to me. Um, but you know, we have a brand where we have, you know, four other consultants. We've got a team of three in South Africa. Jess is in Florida. We've got four sound engineers here in Traverse City. So it's like we are a big team. Um, and so I feel more comfortable with that because we've focused on the branding and the team. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, interesting. I love that approach too. And I think sometimes we um, put more importance on that personal touch than we should. Uh, I think as long as someone responds, people are okay with it. Yeah, yeah um, like even my director of details, she now, like I noticed on Facebook, people were sending me messages and I was missing them. And so I gave Jess access to my Facebook for her to go through those messages, to text me if there's something that was really important. And so she'll say, hey, so-and-so sent you a Facebook message. Um, it's, you know, it's a great compliment or you know, I think it needs a personal touch. Whereas two thirds of them are just, hey, you want to come to this webinar? Hey, you want to do this? And then when I get on Facebook and I see 14 messages, it's like, oh my gosh, I don't want to do this. Like, it's annoying. But then I can just say, what are the two messages I actually need to reply to personally? And the rest just can be like, okay, I'll let Joe know. And, and she'll sign it, Jess. And it's like, whoa, okay. He has someone even checking his Facebook, which, you know, makes me look super powerful and amazing. <laughs> yes, I love that. I think the signing of the name too is, is a good uh, touch and a good strategy yeah. to let people know, like set, set the tone, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So you mentioned before this call doodly videos and I wrote that down, but I actually don't know what it is. So yeah. I want you to tell us about it. So I got sucked into an Instagram ad. <laughs> so I was just like going through Instagram and all of a sudden it was like, do you want to do those hand-drawn cartoon videos? And I was like, yes, I do. <laughs> and I had, I had done Fiverr in the past where I had somebody make those for me. Um, and I thought, you know what? It was like, I don't know, $49 or $97 or something like that. And then of course they have the upsell where you can get access to 10,001 extra cartoons for an extra $97. I'm like, sure, I'll do that. So I didn't want to learn doodly. Uh, you know, I think it's good. I think it looks pretty, but I don't think that's a good use of my time. So right away, I gave Sam all access to it. I, she got access to the Facebook group instead of me for doodly. Um, and I said, what I want you to do is I want you to look at our most popular episodes from the podcast and find just like a two minute teaching that someone taught on something. So we have Lori Gottlieb. She has this, you should talk to someone book. It's a New York Times bestseller. It's really kind of making the circuit. Um, Daniel Pink, we had on the show recently, or Rob Bell, these people who, you know, their episodes people have really liked and people search their names a lot. And so she just pulled out a minute or two of just that audio that I recorded. Some of them, like Rob, I interviewed two years ago. Um, it's still very popular though. And so to now have a new video with Rob Bell's name on it or Daniel Pink's name on it or Lori Gottlieb, now we have these cool little doodly videos that we're releasing that 
takes zero amount of time. All I have to all I had to do was to pay for Doodly and to pay for Sam to go through some training. And now she has creative liberty, which she loves. She's an artist. She wants to do this kind of stuff and learn new skills. Oh, that's so neat. Okay, I'm gonna have to go check out Doodly. Uh, maybe even see if they can sponsor this episode. No, just kidding. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't <that>. kid. <laughs> Make money upon money. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so before we wrap up today, I want to talk about Podcast Launch School because you're doing some really cool things over there. So tell us about it. Yeah, so we actually started by doing done for you podcast launches. We now have 13 podcasts we've helped launch uh, that are all part of the Practice of the Practice podcast network. And so we had our highest end clients that wanted to start a podcast that we really worked through the system and did everything from the sound engineering to the show notes to transcriptions. It, it literally is done for you. So we worked out all the kinks with our highest end clients. Then we said, well, how do we now systematize this to someone that wouldn't want to work with us because they didn't have the budget or they just, they wanted to bootstrap it and put that into a course. And so podcast launch school really is the complimentary course for people that say, I really want to launch a podcast that makes money. Uh, and I want to do it right. And I want someone to tell me that's been there how to do it. And so like, you know, this year we're doing over six figures just in podcast sponsors. And, and so, and we probably get, you know, five to 10,000 downloads per episode. So smaller amount of downloads, but really niched in. And so we walk you through everything we've learned with our done for you people to be able to really say, here's how you create an email course that converts instead of just an email newsletter or email series or an opt-in. Like how do you structure a course to get people to move from a pain to a transformation? Then how do you structure your first 15 episodes in a way that really sets you up as an expert, brings in other experts, but then demonstrates your consulting skills live? And then how do you, once you get an audience going, what questions do you ask to figure out from your audience what the first product should be instead of you just kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall? You want to be able to really have your audience say, here's what I want to buy and to test those things out before you put a whole bunch of time and energy in. And so one kind of core thing we say is fall in love with the pain and the people before you pitch the product. Um, and the more that you can do that, uh, the more the people will say, you know what, you're going to save me time. I would pay you if you did this. And then you can launch the this of that fill in the blank. Ah, oh, it sounds so genius because initially when you said podcast launch school, I was thinking just the podcast piece, but you're really going way beyond that and helping people monetize and develop systems that um, help support something like having a show or having a podcast, which is really genius, which is really great. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Tell us a little bit about how else we can connect with you and everything you're doing with Practice of the Practice. Yeah, so uh, our blog and podcast is over at practiceofthepractice.com. Uh, we actually put together a nine-part email series for your audience that's going to help them with podcasting uh, to be able to get out there to learn more about podcasting, be a good guest, but also potentially start a show. Uh, that's over at Podcast Launch School right there on the main page for them. Uh, and everywhere on social media, we're Practice of the Practice, or you can just search my name, Joe Sanna. Thank you. That's awesome. I'll have the links to all of those things in the show notes. So definitely check those out. Thank you so much, Joe, for joining us today. Oh, this was so much fun, Andrea. Wasn't that interview great? Joe's such a great speaker and I loved having him on this episode. Definitely check out the podcast Launch School if you are interested in his product. I'll put a link to that in the show notes and of course links to everything that we mentioned and we talked about in the show. He's got this resource page that includes guides and ebooks and checklists all about how um, users can start, grow, and scale private practices. So check that out as well. Um, and make sure if you listen to the show, rate, review, subscribe, tag Joe on social media at Practice of the Practice if you found this helpful. And stay tuned because next week I am interviewing Fan Booster themselves, formerly Traject. They are the one of the best sponsors we've had on this show in the you know over a hundred episodes. We I have a really good partnership with them. And they've actually gone through a lot with a lot of the changes happening with Instagram's API. So we're going to get a little bit technical, talk a little bit about what that means for you as a user, um, and also talk with a founder, a founding company, one of the one of the startup companies here in this space, which I always find those conversations to be very interesting myself. So stay tuned because that is coming up next week. I will see you then. Bye for now.